past few weeks, I have allowed myself to have my focus taken away from the Lord. Not in a bad way, but I've been paying attention to a lot of things uh, from the flesh, and I know that uh, it's because I'm letting those things happen. And the Lord's trying to talk to me about spiritual warfare. And I think it's because of that. Thank you. I don't know exactly what he's trying to reveal to me yet. But I know that that's something that's been heavy in my heart for for the past few weeks. And, and uh, every time that it comes to me, I think of the, the exact same words. I have decided. So I'm going to continue to pray on that and see what the Lord's going to reveal to me uh, within the next few days. I don't know if, if he has something planned to reveal to me on Friday night or, or what. Uh, but yeah, that's been going on lately. And I know uh, I need to do, I need to go back to the position where I was originally before this whole thing started. Anyway, other than that, uh, good testimony of God's provision for my life. Uh, I've been having this issue with my ceiling that needs to get repaired and I did my taxes, got the refund and whatnot. So yesterday the guys came over to look at what they were going to do and then they called me and said okay this is going to cost you this much. So the price went up about 60%. Which is fine because I have the money to cover the whole thing. But now I have to get my wife involved, and I know where she is right now. <laughs> I thought I was going to get some resistance. Uh, so backtracking a little, one of the guys that went to the house to look at it, when I saw him and they introduced me to him, he looked really familiar. So I said, what's your last name? He's like, this. I said, is your wife this person? Yeah, well, I, I work with her. Well, I think the Lord led this guy to my house because of the fact that I know his wife, they gave me a discount on the price of the job. <laughs> so, yeah. So then after uh, I get the quote and all that and I get the final price, I call my wife and I said, hey, uh, the price that I told you originally is not gonna be, it's gonna be this much. All right, so how much do you need this? All right, I'll be there in less than an hour. She brought me the money right away. Wow. So now everything's set up. Uh, all the funds are available. My ceiling's going to get repaired. And uh, it's all good. Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise the Lord. And, yeah. started coming to my mind and I'm like, no, Lord's gonna take care of me because he told me to. Praise the Lord. So Amen. but yeah. Anyway, anyone has any prayer requests this morning? Um Pastor. I do want us to remember uh, Evelyn Taylor's family. She passed away last night. And so that's you know Jody and Jason and of course Sarah and John, the husband. <coughs> 
before the Lord and put all our requests on him and he, we know that he yes. hears our hearts. Yes. Father, we thank you for bringing us together in this place tonight, Lord. We thank you for your presence being in this place. 
Father, pour in your grace over us. We thank you, Father, for your blessings, for your promises. We thank you for all the words that you give us, Father. The word that keeps us going forward every day, Lord. The word that lifts us up. Your word that is the truth, Father. Right now, we bring those of you that are in need of healing. We bind whatever it is that is oppressing them, Lord, that is not letting them live this life as you intended it to be, Father. We thank you, Father, for healing that you have declared over us. Your word, the work of the cross, Father, that Jesus did it all. You finished it. Everything has been completed. And now we stand on that word and declare it, knowing that it will come to pass in our lives, Father. We ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit comfort those that are going through a loss right now. The loss of a loved one. revelation that you bring forth through your words and your Holy Spirit. Revelation that continues to grow our knowledge of you, Father. Renewing our minds so that we can go out into this world and share with people who you are. So we can tell them who you are, Lord, that you are God of love. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. We give you all the honor Every time that I stand, every time that I stand here, and uh, we stand up to pray, it always comes to my mind: What am I going to say? I just <laughs> the Holy Spirit take care. Hallelujah. Yeah. I, I can I cannot continue to keep thinking that. Anyway, this Friday, Eastern Gate House of Prayer. I know that good things are going to happen. I, I'm I'm starting to feel it. day of the week, um, and I know I don't have time to put anything together or whatever, but I saw, I saw, and I explained to Cindy the other night, um, banners around here representing different things about marriage, uh, government, um, you know, the body of Christ, uh, revival, just different ba banners around the room where people can have a focus, you know, oh yeah, I, I forgot about that, just focus on that, I saw different banners in there. In between the windows and around the front, there's like six or eight different ones. It was really cool. And, and uh, I've seen them in the past and, and other ministries and stuff, but that was years ago. And then all of a sudden, boom, it just come flashing in the, night, uh, in the middle of the night. I had fighting acid reflux. And I was just <laughs> finding it. It, it, was the, it wasn't the pizza. It was the lasagna. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I got, I got up and, and I took some Tumter. No, but I had a guy go from like 12 to 1.30 in the morning. It was just, I was struggling with that in my flesh, but my my spirit, all this stuff was coming, almost like pictures. And I was even seeing the colors like you see in the windows, and the colors on the banners and stuff like that, and even the stands to hold the flags. All the all the plans are right there. I just <laughs> have to do it, or you know, to do it and stuff like that. Um, so something's up Friday night, and that's why it's going to take the whole body to come together and pray, just to seek the Lord's face. <laughs> All right, and then we're going to have a soup town dinner on 22nd after service. Yep. So if you can bring something good, if not, that's fine. Come, there's always plans, like oh, Mike yeah, said, yeah. on Sunday. Amen. And it's always good food. All right, well, let's pick the word. Will you, you not revive us again? again? That your and people may rejoice, rejoice in you. Hallelujah. I am a believer, and these 
signs do follow me. In the name of Jesus, I cast out demons, I speak in new tongues, I lay hands on the sick and they do recover. Christ has redeemed me from the curse of the law. Therefore, I forbid any sickness or disease to come upon this body. Every disease, germ, and every virus that touches this body dies instantly in the name of Jesus. Every organ and every tissue of this body functions to the perfection to which God created it to function. And I forbid any malfunction in this body in the name of Jesus. I receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him, the eyes of my understanding being enlightened. And I am not conformed to this world, but I am transformed by the renewing of my mind. My mind is renewed by the word of God. The Lord reveals the devour for my sake, and no weapon that is formed against my finances will prosper. All obstacles and hindrances to my financial prosperity are now dissolved. The Lord has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant, and Abraham's blessings are mine. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. John, would you mind? Just shake off the things of today.
desperate for you and your holy word and revelation, Lord. Oh, and I'm lost without you. Praise God. Praise God. Let's lift our hands to the Lord right now. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we love you tonight. We're so grateful, Lord, for your, for your faithfulness. We're thankful, Lord, for all that you're doing, the seen and the unseen. We thank you, Jesus, that all things will work together for our good because we do love you, Lord. We depend on you. We look to you, the author and finisher of our faith, our Jehovah Jireh, our God that supplies every need, the God that's whatever we need you to be today is what you are in our life, Lord. Above and beyond everything we could ever ask or hope or think, we bless you tonight, Lord. We lift you up and magnify you. We worship you for you alone are God. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. <clears throat> Everybody said in Jesus' name, hallelujah. God bless you. Please be seated. Thanks, everybody, for being here tonight. Thank you for our worship duo. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We all did good. Amen. It's always good. Wherever two or more are gathered together, he's here. He doesn't need a big crowd. We like a big crowd, but he doesn't need one. He can do the same thing here, amen, as he can do with thousands. In fact, sometimes I think he can do more because we... Aren't as many to get in the way, praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Roberto, for your words of wisdom, as always. Praise the Lord. Appreciate it. You did good. You did good. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your testimonies. They always, they always mean more than you can imagine. Praise the Lord. So. But the idea that, you know, we were all talking about God's faithfulness and how he, he never leaves us or forsakes us. And that's kind of what I want to talk about tonight in a, just a simple message. I'm not going to try to get all complex here because then I get confused. Praise the Lord. So I just have to keep it simple. Praise the Lord. But let's go to Matthew chapter 26. And we'll start off here with uh, verses 36 through 38. Roberto, if you can get us there. Everybody say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yes, please. Matthew 26, verses 36 through 38. Thank you, Jesus. Man, the Lord has given us some beautiful weather. It's supposed to stay nice. In fact, it's going to be in the 70s on Sunday. So this is good stuff. After this winter, anything above freezing is good. And I'm sure, I'm sure Tim's enjoying it because he's feeling a whole lot more secure out there on those roads without all the people slipping and sliding and not knowing quite what they're supposed to do or how they're going to do it. So it's safer for everybody. Praise the Lord. Okay, so then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. So Jesus was experiencing an internal excuse me, and a mental agony that was so unbearable that he felt like the pain alone from this internal struggle that he was having was enough to kill him. And he felt like it, it could happen right here and right now, what I'm going through, what I'm feeling, the, the, the agony, the, the sorrow, the stress, the anxiety even. And uh, so you say, well, What's the reason for this, the magnitude of Jesus' agony and his horror before his death? And the answer is, this was a different death than anybody had ever died or ever will die from that point past 
from that point forward. He faced a death unlike any death that anyone would ever face. And so then Matthew kind of goes on with this account. And uh, let's look at verses 39 through 44 here, say in verse, uh, chapter 26, 39 through 44. And he went a little farther and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. So this word cup, in ancient times, that cup was like the electric chair, like lethal injection. You know, I mean, it was... Remember, remember the story uh, of Socrates' death? You know, he had gone awry with the uh, political powers that were in, in uh, place at the time. And his uh, execution was self-inflicted. They gave him a cup of poison, and he drank it. That's a picture, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but there's, there's always that picture of Socrates' death, and that's it. It's him taking that cup and drinking the poison. So uh, the, the cup didn't represent just any kind of death uh, in general, but it, it represented a judicial death. In other words, it wasn't just somebody committing suicide or somebody just taking the cup. The cup itself represented a judicial death. So Jesus knows that he's going to be executed. Now, we know that he gave his life, but he was executed, right? So even more than that, let's look at Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 23, verse uh, 33. And here's prophetic words speaking of, uh, it's, it's prophecy, but it's also what God was doing at the time uh, in the situations where people were rebelling against him and, and uh, dealing with sin and so forth. And he tells him, he says, you'll be filled with the drunkenness and sorrow, with the cup of astonishment and desolation, with, thy, with the cup of thy sister, Samaria. In other words, you're going you're to suffer the same kinds of uh, punishment, amen, as your sister, Samaria. All right, let's look at Isaiah then. We're just a couple of these references. Isaiah 51, verse 17, just so you can see where the cup, what the cup actually represents. Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, which has drunk at the hand of the Lord the cup of his fury. Thou hast drunken the dregs of the cup of trembling and wrung them out. Praise the Lord. So the cup represents judicial execution, right? Now, when Jesus speaks of the cup, it's, uh, it's showing that he knows that he's facing not just physical torture. He's not just facing a normal death. He's about to experience the full divine wrath on the evil and the sin of all humanity. He knows this. He's, he's aware of this. That's what this is all about. That's what's going on here. The judicial wrath of God is about to come down on him instead of us. Right. Praise the Lord. Now, let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8. inflaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the judgment of God in the Bible, it's fair. It's really fair because it's a natural consequence because the essence of sin is people just basically saying, I don't want to have anything to do with life or with the life of God. I don't want God messing in my life. That's the essence of what sin is. Just don't want it. Don't, don't want to be bothered with it. I don't want it around. I don't want to be messed with. So the essence of God's judicial wrath is to give us what we ask for. Praise the Lord. And so there's nothing fairer than that. 
people that don't want God, they don't get God. But there's nothing more terrible than that. Praise the Lord. Remember what Ezekiel and Isaiah said. We just read it here. The cup of God's wrath is like poison. And it makes the body stagger and burn internally in inner pain. Praise the Lord. And that's what's beginning to happen to Jesus here in the garden. He's seeing no father, no presence, no relationship. Instead of heaven, he's seeing hell. But Jesus' situation was even worse than that because he began to experience not just the absence of love, but the, press, the pressure of God's wrath. So it wasn't just like, I don't have God now. I don't have God, but I have God's wrath. And both of those are immeasurable. You know, we talk about the end times and uh, after the church is out of here and how the book of Revelation talks about all these horror things that happen. Think about this. If the church is gone, the Spirit of God is gone. Right. The presence of God is gone. Right. That is exactly what Jesus is talking about here. Mm. Well, people don't want God, so God says, okay, we're out of here. But then what happens is the absence of God, the love of God, the mercy of God, the grace of God, brings what we call the wrath of God. Judgments just start coming. It's a natural outcome of the rejecting of God. It's the fairest thing that there is. People, you know, they'll, they'll fight about it, but the truth is they're making their own choice. They're making their own decision here. Right. Amen? So this is, it's more than just uh, bad. It's the good is immeasurable, and so is the wrath of God immeasurable. God is omnipotent, which means he's all-powerful. He's infinitely powerful. powerful. His, he's immeasurably wrathful. In other words, his wrath is as immeasurable as his power is. There's, people don't have any idea what the wrath of God is like. Jesus is beginning to experience it. Amen? So when Jesus went to the cross, he took on himself the punishment for sins that we deserved, and he didn't, right? That's a given. We all, we all know that, right? That's called passive work, okay? In other words, he didn't do anything. He just took the punishment. It's passive. He just went to the cross, and he took all the punishment that we deserved. Amen? For our disobedience to God's law, he suffers. Praise the Lord. That's passive. The result, we who believe in Jesus are free from any condemnation for those sins. Praise the Lord. But if that was all that he did, if it was just the passive work that he did, we still wouldn't have security when it comes to the love of God. And let me explain. We'd still be under pressure and fear to do something to remain right with God. Right? right? He took the punishment for everything that we did to break the law, to disobey. But if that was all he did, we'd still be struggling with trying to measure up somehow to keep that relationship, to keep that focus, right? right. So we'd still be under pressure. We'd still be under fear to remain right with God. Mm -hmm. Now, during Jesus' life, he fulfilled the positive demands of the law, too, all the active work, mm -hmm. right? He lived the perfect life. No one ever loved God with all of their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind. Nobody's ever done it except Jesus. Right. We try, we love, but there's, we're, just not, we're not perfect, right. so we fail. No one's ever loved his neighbor Amen? Perfectly. Nobody's ever done it but Jesus. You know, I'm talking about full sacrificial love, the way it's defined in the Bible. Nobody's ever done that. Nobody except Jesus. And you could go on down through all the other things that God has talked about. But just think about this. What's, what's a life like that deserves 
God's highest blessing, praise, and honor. What's a life like that deserves God's full honor and delight? This is my son in whom I am well pleased, delighted in him, right? Imagine the life of someone who deserves. I mean, don't, don't, don't misunderstand me. Somebody deserves this. Imagine what that life would be like. Mm-hmm. Well, Jesus did it in our place. Yes, he you. did it as our substitute. Thank you, Lord. It means not only he got the penalty that we deserved, we get the reward from God that he deserved. Mm-hmm. This is big. I mean, we may get this sometimes intellectually, but I'm telling you, it, it will change your life if you really understand this and really realize this. Mm-hmm. It isn't just that we're not being punished for the bad things we did and the disobedience that we've had throughout our life, but we're receiving a reward as if we had lived a perfect life, as if we are now living a perfect life. Mm-hmm. This is the active work of Christ. The passive is one thing, the active is another. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. It's it's complete salvation. It's grace piled on top of grace. It's grace for grace. Amen. (laughs) You get get to escape the punishment, the wrath of God Mm -hmm. by his grace. Mm -hmm. And by his grace, so grace for grace, and then grace on top of that. Now you get the reward for what you never did. You get not punished for what you did, and you get rewarded for what you didn't do. Come on. I mean, that's, that's the epitome of grace. That's the, that's the, the perfect description of grace. Come on. And it's what's called full salvation. Mm-hmm. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> so that, let, let's look at what it has to do with Jesus in the garden then, because that's where our text begins. <clears throat> Jesus knew what was going to come. He knew what was about to take place. He's saying, if there's any way I can escape this immeasurable wrath that's going to be poured out for the sins of the entire world. And it's like God sets the cup in front of Jesus. It was still possible for Jesus to back out, to pull away. He could still do it. He wasn't being forced to. He was commanded, if you will, by God to do it. That's why he was here. But he didn't have to. And so, in effect, the father's saying, here's the cup. Taste this. Smell this. Think about it. Think about what's going to happen here. Think about what's to come. This scene in the, in the garden, it's, it's, this is the most perfect act of obedience to God. Because he doesn't have to do this. Right? This is, I'm not saying that he would have withdrawn you know, from the cross. He could have calmed down legions of angels. He could have got away at any time. But I'm saying this is leading all up to this. And he's aware of what's taking place. He's already beginning to experience it. Because think about this. In the beginning of history, in the genesis of man, there was a garden and there was a command, was there not? Mm-hmm. Amen. God put Adam and Eve in that garden. And he told them not to eat of the tree, right? Not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He says, obey me about the tree and you'll live, right? Obey me and I'll bless you. Mm-hmm. And they disobeyed. Now here we are in another garden, the second Adam and another command. Jesus was sent to go to the cross. Another tree. Praise the Lord. The command to Adam was the prototype. If you think about it, it's the prototype for every command to everybody. Mm-hmm. Obey me, and I'll bless you. Right? Amen. I'll be with you. Amen. I won't leave you. I'll stay with you. Right? Because you're obeying me. Here's the exception. To the second Adam, he says, Obey me about the tree cross, and I'll 
crush you. And Jesus does. Jesus, first and last, the only person that was told obedience will bring a curse. If you obey me, if you're faithful to me, I'll forsake you. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I'll cast you off. I'll send you to hell. And yet, Jesus obeyed. Okay, now back to the passive, active obedience of Christ. Jesus didn't just die the death that we should have died. Passive. He lived the life we should have lived. Active. When we believe in him, we don't just get benefits by his death. Our sins are forgiven. But we get benefits of his obedience. That means his righteousness is credited to us. Or as the scripture says, imputed. In other words, it's as if it's our righteousness, as if we deserved it. Second mm -hmm. Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. We're the righteousness of God in Christ. Praise the Lord. Amen. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. It's the Lord. So we're seen as righteous. We're seen as obedient. We're seen to be doing as well as Jesus did. Mm -hmm. Now, I tell you, this is awesome. Because the devil will come to you half a dozen times a day and tell you, God, you know, God's really mad about that. God's really upset about that behavior. God really doesn't like that thing you just thought. He doesn't like that thing you just said. He doesn't like that deal you just... I'm not saying we should live, you know, pagan-like lives. I'm just saying God sees you as though you're living your life perfectly, as perfectly as Jesus. If not, his justice is not fair. So when we talk about grace, it's not just I'm escaping hell because of what Jesus did, that my sins are forgiven. I live every day of my life in the eyes of God. It looks like Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I am righteous. I am holy. I am why? Because He lived a perfect life, and I get the reward for it. Thank you, Lord. By believing in His death, burial, and resurrection. By believing in Him as my Savior. This is huge. I mean, it goes beyond anything religion could ever provide for us. Mm -hmm. This is the relationship. This is what, this is what makes it so, so intimate. This is why we can, he can honestly say without, you know, a wink or a, n a nudge, you know, you. come boldly yes. to the throne of grace. Come like you deserve it. Come on. And we're going, oh, but I, I know I don't. No. Come in as if you were Jesus. Because that's how he's dealing with you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. We're seen as righteous. We're seen as obedient. We're seen as if we were doing everything perfectly the way Jesus did it. Our... our uh, Weak, our feeble, our kind of up and down, inconsistent love for God is seen as perfect love. Our struggles to love our neighbor, who's your neighbor, everybody, you, you know, yeah. our, our struggles at, at loving others perfectly, God sees it perfectly. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. So look at him in the garden doing all this, not as an example, as a substitute. Mm -hmm. He's not there saying, I want you all to measure up to this. He's saying, I am the substitute, so you get treated as though 
it's you doing it. Now, I, I just honestly believe the, the revelation of this, the real understanding of this, will make Christians better people. Because when they fail, they fail, but they're still right with God. There's, everything's still good with God. It, so what you do, you do out of love, not out of a sense of fear or punishment. You just do it because, hey, it's, it's good. I can do it. I can do it. If I fail, I fail. I just try to do better. The motivation is no longer about me. It's about him. Yes. It's about my way of expressing that I love the Lord. Yes. I'm not obligated, do you see? And, and that's the whole theme of, 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 the, uh, of the new covenant. Yes. You cannot do this. But I love you so much that I'm going to do it. Yes. So I can satisfy the demands of justice of the judicial law that God has in place. Because the fact is, we're not under the law, but the law still exists. It exists for him who is not under grace. Mm -hmm. So there's still wrath to be poured out. There's still the judgment of God to be poured out. But only on those who have refused the grace of God. Yes, yes. Thank you, Lord. When you believe in Jesus... You're not just forgiven, but you're a beautiful child. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> okay, I know as the older, the older we get, the harder that is to believe. I was just talking to Cindy before church. I had my driver's license picture taken a couple weeks ago. <laughs> oh, God, it was hideous. I said, who is that old man? They wouldn't do a redo. <laughs> it wouldn't have mattered. It would have just been twice as ugly. But I mean, I mean think about this. To God... We are beautiful. Thank you, Lord. He sees us as precious, as perfectly obedient. I mean, if the cup didn't make him give up on us, nothing's going to make him give up on us. Right. Right. You can be assured that he will never leave you or forsake you. That's right. If he was ever going to leave us or forsake us, he had his opportunity and he refused it knowing full well what horrors he was going to go through. And he did it anyway. Praise the Lord. Let's, let's wrap up with these last couple of scriptures. Let's go to Romans 8, uh, 38 and 39. We ought to leave church happy. We ought to leave church excited. You know? Expecting good. Because there's nothing in here about the New Testament believer, the New Covenant believer, that has any reason to be sorrowful. Come on. He that believes in Christ, that is in Christ, can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. God will never leave you. God will always be there to buttress you. God will always be there to lift you up. God will always be there to encourage you. Always be there to help you through. Always be there to supply whatever the need is. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. I'm persuaded, neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. Paul could say that because he understood Jesus had already made the decision in the garden that nothing was going to separate him from his, belief, from his children, from those who believe in him. Praise God. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, and we'll quit with this. Anybody that thinks God is not good doesn't know God. They just don't know him. Anybody that thinks he's, he's doing bad stuff to people just does not have any kind of revelation of God. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have, for he, say, he hath said, I will never leave thee. Nor for sake. So what he's saying, whatever you are, wherever you're at, whatever you got, stay cool, keep a good testimony, because I'm going to be with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I've heard Tim talk about his life scripture. It's so true. David said, I was young, now I'm old. But there's one thing that I know. I've never seen the 
righteous forsaken. Amen. Or their seed begging bread. That's that scripture. That's what he's talking about. It may look like it. It may look like the pantry's not full. It may look like, you know, uh, things are not going exactly right. But he always comes through. He cannot do anything other than that. God has declared you his delight. When he said to Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased, he said it to you. Amen. The moment you became a believer, Amen. he sees you exactly like he sees Jesus. I know that's, that is so hard to get our minds around, but it's the absolute essence of this new covenant teaching. Amen. We are perfect in him. Lord. And that is the good news, church. Thank that you. is good news. No matter, you cannot screw this thing up enough. And believe me, I've tried. Not intentionally, but I've done it. I've, I've screwed up. I, I've made my mistake. I've, I've, you know, failed. There's been people I would have liked to have just taken out and praise the Lord. <laughs> Extended the right hand of fellowship right upside their head. Praise the Lord. I, I haven't loved everybody like I should love them. I haven't loved God the way I should. But God has never, ever not loved me, been faithful to me. Thank you, Lord. It's awesome. It's, it's just unbelievable what he has done through the death, burial, and resurrection. Praise God. Thank you. It never gets better. It's good now, and it only gets better. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap this evening. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. So when you quote that scripture, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ, say it with confidence. Hallelujah. Jesus paid a tremendous price mm -hmm. for us to have it. It's just, it's disrespectful for us not to live a life that projects that same reality. True. Amen. Amen. People want to pick and judge and criti critique and criticize. It, it's only because they don't, they, they, they're not experiencing the love of God. Come on. They, they don't understand what God has really done for them. Right. Amen? Amen. You, I, I, we've, we've probably all of us have wandered away from God to some extent. You know, from the time we were saved. You can't outrun God. That's right. He, he just, he's, he's like a bloodhound. He won't let you go. He stays on you. Once you've come to him, you, he won't forsake you. He won't leave you. You can do stuff. You can, you can, you know, create consequences and so on and so forth. But all, it's just the slightest indication that are, are you still here, Lord? And he runs to us just like the prodigal son's father. Mm -hmm. Embraces us. Puts the robe back on. The ring on the finger. Mm -hmm. It's my son. He was lost. Found. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Amen. Life is good because of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And it doesn't get any better than this. Praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight. God bless you. Go out with confidence in the joy of the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Thanks again, everybody, for being here tonight.